Thank you so much. I'm incredibly excited to be here. It's a real privilege to be both in Seoul and to be at this forum. Uh, I want to apologize in advance to the people who were simultaneously translating for me in the back of the room because I know I speak too quickly. Uh, I promise I will try to go as slowly as I know how. As I was thinking about this forum and I was thinking about the theme of coexistence, I was really struck by how much it lines up with the things I'm also preoccupied by. I spend my time thinking about the relationship between technology and culture, and the notion of coexistence was a really provocative one for me. I was also, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about here, remembering this piece of video that turned up on YouTube late last year. It showed a conversation between a Furby, which was a digital pet from the 1990s, and Apple's Siri. For those of you who don't remember the Furbies, they were really annoying. Their ears wiggled, and their eyes fluttered, and they squeaked, <coughs> basically. So the conversation goes, <coughs> and the Siri says, are you looking for shell oil? And the Furby says, <coughs> would you like to call Jeff? And it goes on like this. And I realized that there was something really instructive about this. It wasn't just a funny conversation, but it was about what was going to happen when technology could start to engage with us. What did it mean at the point that technology didn't just talk, but technology could listen? Because after all, in some ways, the most powerful thing about Siri is not that it's voice recognition technology, it's that it promises to listen. And in listening, it makes a very different promise about what coexistence might look like. So how did I get here, and why would I be telling you all of this? So I'm an anthropologist. I work at Intel. I spend my life studying the intersection of technology and people. I do that by going to people's homes and getting a sense about what makes them tick. I'm also a second-generation anthropologist, so I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia, which meant I spent my childhood with people who remembered a different kind of coexistence, who remembered their country before Europeans came, who remembered what it was like to live there before Western civilization arrived. And that meant I spent my childhood running around with no shoes, killing everything. Not coexistence for the animals, but a good one for me. When I came to Intel, I was given the task of helping Intel think about people and technology and think about what it was that knowing what people cared about could do to drive innovation. So if you understood what people cared about, what they were passionate about, could you use that to spark new innovation? And I thought I was making progress until recently some of my engineers said, we've understood the question you're asking, we've paid attention to people, and we have found our users. And they showed me this picture. And I looked at the engineers and I said, who do you think you've found? And they're like, well, we've found your users. And I'm like, OK, where in the world do you find three generations of white people, all in the same place, happy, sharing television? And where do you have small children and white furniture? Where is there no clutter? And as one of my colleagues said, where would she have the remote control? And I realized that they had found a fantasy. This is very seductive and it's very dangerous because it suggests that somewhere there is a room of people waiting to be delighted by us, but there's nothing we need to deal with. There is no difficulty, no complication. And my colleagues and I came back and said, no, the reality is this. If you want to make new technology, you're making it into a room that is incredibly complicated. It's full of equipment. This room has a television, a VCD, a DVD, seven remote controls, a fax and photocopying machine, and an automatic foot massage machine. It's very full. And what it means to think here about the future of technology is understanding what people care about and what they're really passionate about. So as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about here, it struck me that the most useful thing I could do as an anthropologist was talk you through nine different moments of stories from our history and from the present about what it means to coexist with technology. So what are the stories about people and machinery? The first one comes from my own fieldwork. This was in China many years ago, indeed many years ago. And one of the women I was working with said to me that she thought about her technology as being like a backpack full of baby birds with their mouths open, screaming, feed me, feed me, feed me, because they needed power and content and passwords, and it was incredibly demanding. For her, these devices were incredibly needy. And sometimes she said, all I want to do is zip up the backpack and throw it in the river. That's a really sort of powerful 
story and not a good one about coexistence, but it got me to thinking about why is it that we imagine machines to be needy and what are the stories we're telling here. So I want to go back in, into Western history for just a moment here. Back in the 1700s in France and in Switzerland, there was a move to create mechanical objects, toys, basically, little proto-robots, automatons they were called, that were designed to mimic real life. The most famous of these was by a man named Jacques Vaucusson. He was French and he created a thing called the digesting duck. This is a picture of it here. This duck was about this high. It had 400 individual pieces in it. And when you fed it, the food went through it and came out the other end. This was considered to be quite a marvel as an object because it replicated real life. It made digesting noises, it quacked, it waddled. It was very duck-like. And here in this early moment of man and machine, of people and machine, what you saw was an object that was designed to look like it was real. Because if it looked human, if it looked duck-like, it would be in some ways less frightening. So the coexistence here was about how do you basically create life so that it didn't feel like a machine, it felt like a duck. Clearly in the Western tradition, the most powerful moment, the most powerful story we have about our relationships to technology comes from 100 years later. And it comes from England and it comes from a moment in history called the Luddites, when a bunch of weavers and people who were engaged in the cloth business suddenly found themselves being done out of a job by mechanized looms. And their response was to go and break the looms. So here there is no coexistence. There is merely destruction of the technology before the technology destroys us. And that sense of what it means to have technology in one's life, of how dangerous the technology is, this is a very dominant fear. And it runs through Western traditions until the present day. And here the coexistence is about destruction, not about a relationship. Of course, if you move forward from that early moment of technology to a much more contemporary one, a man named Alan Turing, who is arguably the founder of much contemporary artificial intelligence work and computer science, took about imagining a different kind of coexistence with technology. And he asked in 1950 the incredibly profound question about the future of computing. And he said, can a machine think? What would it be if machines could think? He specifically said, what would it be if machines can think like a man? But let's give him some credit here and imagine that he meant all of us. So what might it be for machines to think like humans? Of course, in so doing, he already created the notion of what the relationship would be. Again, the machine had to be like us. It had to think like us. I suspect now we might ask a different question. What might it be not if the machine could think, but if the machine could feel? Maybe we don't want the machine to be in an intellectual relationship with us. We actually want it to be in an emotional relationship. So the question might be instead, can a machine feel? Can a machine emote? Can a machine have a relationship with us? But for Turing and for computer science, the question was much more, could you make technology think like people? Of course, for those of you who know your science fiction, you know what comes next. If machines can think like people, they will become like people, and the very first thing they will do is kill us all. This is perhaps not a dominant trope in South Korean science fiction, but it is certainly a dominant notion in American and Western science fiction. That if technology gets smart enough, if it becomes as smart as us, the very first thing it will do is kill us. And here again, there is no notion of coexistence. There is merely a notion of domination. This runs through everything from the Terminator, from which this quote is drawn, to all of Philip K. Dick's science fiction, to 2001, A Space Odyssey, a whole lot of those places where this notion of the relationship between people and technology is one where once equality is achieved, it has to again tip the scales in the other direction. But what if we could imagine some other narratives? What if we looked globally, beyond the West, beyond this kind of thread that runs from the Luddites to the fear the machines will kill us? What if there were some other stories about relationships between people and technology you could tell? The first example I have of this comes from Islam and comes from a series of books that were published between 850 AD and 1206 AD. These were books that were books of engineering diagrams and blueprints. They were designs for new technologies. Those technologies were called by their various makers ingenious. But the most interesting thing about them was what they proposed to do. Many of the devices in these books, including the one pictured here, were not about efficiency. This object here is, in fact, an automatic robotic 
peacock water dispenser. Not the kind of thing you'd imagine needing terribly often, but it turns out part of how this device was built was that water comes out of its mouth so that at the time of prayer, at Salah in the Islamic tradition, you could wash your hands. So water is dispensed from this not to make you more efficient, but to make you more pure. This is about achieving ritual purity, about achieving a state of grace. This was an object designed to make water appear basically as if by magic to continue the ritual of being able to pray. And here an entire set of engineering devices weren't just about efficiencies, but they were about creating temples, they were about creating mosques, they were about delivering all manner of forms of effectively enlightenment. So a very different notion of what you might get if you had technology and people together. If you look to a different massive tradition and you go to India, in Sanskrit poetry from now nearly two and a half thousand years ago, there are a series of accounts of technology. Flying viminas, which are like uh, aeroplanes basically, transported the gods around. These were designed to inspire wonder and awe. In the same texts, the term yantra, which means device in Sanskrit, was also coined. Here, device is not understood as being something mechanical, but being as understood as something that controls the energy within it to achieve a certain outcome. So here, machinery and device is about a notion of the energy within it and the spirit. And when you look across the Sanskrit and Hindi tradition here, what you see is not machines on one hand and people on the other occupying two different zones, but instead a notion of people and technology as part of a spectrum of what it means to be in the world, where both of those things are simply about a spectrum of energy and of consciousness, where machines can have a form of consciousness. And imagining again here, what does that mean to think about coexistence when the machines are in fact in some ways cognizant on their own is a very different idea of what it might mean to think about technology. Closer to Korea, this last example comes from Japan from the Edo period when drawing on the work that was actually being done in Europe, a bunch of effectively robot builders before there were robots worked out how to hack Swiss watches and made little tiny mechanical dolls. This is one of the most famous of them. It was designed to deliver a cup of tea. You wound it up, it had a whalebone spring, and it took the tea across the table. When you took the teacup out, it backed away again. Again, this is not about notions of mechanization as efficiency. This isn't about machines as replacing our labor, about doing things faster. This is about technology supporting a very different set of human needs and human preoccupations. This is about ideas of grace, of ritual, of spiritual activity. It's a very different sense of what a coexistence might look like. So where does all of that leave us? Well, part of what I want to kind of suggest here is that technology and people are already in a relationship. What that relationship looks like is different in different parts of the world. It's different because of different cultures and different histories and different ideas about what machinery is. But it's also the case that some forms of coexistence are already happening. This object here comes from Malaysia. I bought it a year ago. Uh, in the Chinese diaspora, once a year there is a ceremony, uh, a, a period of time, a festival, called Qingming, or the Festival of Shining Bright. And during that festival, you take care of your ancestors. You tend their graves, you honor their memories, and in particular, you burn paper objects. And the fire transforms those paper objects into real things in the hands of your ancestors. Historically, people burnt paper, they burnt material objects, they burnt things that looked like cars and houses and pieces of technology. These days, people also burn digital technology. Smartphones, televisions, laptops, and last year, iPads. And this was an iPad that I bought from one of the shops that sells this stuff. The man only had two. I asked why there were so few, and he said, it's an iPad. They're scarce, even for the dead. And I realized that one of the things that was happening here was here was a moment where technology had moved over from being a literal piece of technology that did a piece of work to something that was symbolic. 
because here is a piece of technology that doesn't actually work. You can't get to the internet on this paper iPad. But when it is set fire to, when it is burnt, it lands in the hands of your family, your deceased family, and becomes real again. And imagining here what it means to think about coexistence isn't just going to be practical. Some of the coexistence we imagine between people and technology will also be symbolic. It will be about the technologies that move across the barrier from being things that we think of as being practical to things that we can't imagine being without. And here is a piece of technology that's so important that not only can you not be alive without it, you can't be dead without it either. And imagining what that coexistence looks like is a very different proposition for thinking about our relationships between us and technology, and also between the bits of technology themselves. So where does all of that leave us? As I was thinking about how to put all of this back together again, for me, there were a couple of things that were critically important to think about. One is that as we imagine what it means to talk about a coexistence between people and technology, we have to imagine that there are many different forms that that might take. And those forms are going to be influenced by a whole range of cultural movements, a whole range of different ways of thinking about things. And when I often start my talk with that example of the Furby and the Siri, one of the things that I routinely hear back is that we don't want technology to be that close to us, right? That we fear what will happen. That there's a whole anxiety about what it means to imagine a coexistence. And as you start to chart that history of where that fear might come from, you see that it's rooted in a very particular set of anxieties that come out of a very particular set of moments, particularly in Western history, that take you from mechanical objects that faked life to mechanical objects that threaten to replace human beings, at least in their form of labor, to mechanical objects that threaten to replace people in terms of their intelligence. And now we have a set of them that threaten to replace us in our entirety, our whole being, our labor, our intellectual work, even our emotional work. And for me, the interesting thing here to contemplate is what if there are other stories that we could also draw on that would be useful here? So what if we go back and look at how it is that machinery and technology is constituted in Islam, or in Buddhism, or in Hinduism, or in Confucianism, or in the various countries in which those big world thoughts happen? Because chances are in each one of those places we'll see a different unfolding of people and their relationship to technology, and what we imagine the work is that gets done there. And for me, the most powerful thing to imagine is what it would be if, in some ways, as coexistence is predicated, you have to imagine that this is actually not about an interaction. This is not about an object and the command you give it. It's not about saying, go to the web and find, eh, <laughs> find me the answer to this, connect to the network. What if instead what we're imagining here is something that isn't about us controlling the technology? but the technology growing up enough and becoming, in some ways, secure enough to have a relationship with us. Because coexistence, in some ways, is predicated on the notion of a relationship. And I want to believe, as I look at these other traditions, at the ingenious devices from Islam, at the early robots out of Japan, and indeed the later work in Japanese robotics, and in Hinduism, too, that suggests that machinery stands a better chance of achieving certain kinds of nirvana and personhood because it has infinite patience, unlike us. What would it mean if you start to weave all those things together? And for me, you get left in a really interesting place that says the charter as we move forward as technology developers and as technology commentators is one where we should be asking less about how quickly does something work, how efficient is it, but much more about what does it mean to us? How do we feel about it? What is the relationship that's being developed here? And what might it be if what you do is suggest a technology program that's about building machines that have a relationship with us, not ones that we command and control? Of course, you have to do that knowing that the machines won't kill you. Um, and I'm fairly convinced that won't happen. Reasonably convinced 
that won't happen. But it also means how do we start to accommodate all the other things that are happening currently? Whether that means thinking about the prevalence of big data, and as Steve Barmer said this morning, machine learning. So how do we start to think about what all of the new technology that comes into this story will look like? But for me, the starting place has to be, what do we do if we imagine this is about a coexistence and a relationship, not about a command and control infrastructure? So with that, I wanted to say thank you. <laughs>